In a world of gods and mortals, magic is a closely guarded gift bestowed by the divine onto their worshippers. But even among the magically blessed, there are those who stand apart in their deeply arcane nature. In the humble farming town of Hearth live three unaging elders. They bear allegiance to no known god, yet have lived for centuries on the outskirts of the community that has grown around their vast estate. The three teachers, as they've been dubbed, have only recently opened up the private collections of history, crafts, and knowledge to the town. Our story follows their chosen apprentices. How they came to know the mysterious, ageless figures, and how they came to change each other. Welcome to the Evergreen Kingdom Campaign. Welcome, one and all new listeners, new friends, to the first episode of Story Horde. We are a D&D storytelling podcast uh, hosted by the four of us. I'm Grace. I'm Kev. I'm Maddie. I'm Margaret. We're four friends who met at art school uh, and have kept in touch the last few years by playing D&D over Discord, telling stories, making characters, and building worlds based on our collective imaginations. This is our first attempt at doing a proper podcast uh, following one of our campaigns. We've been building these campaigns for each other for a number of years now, and this will be our first attempt at cataloging it and editing it and doing something a little bit more uh refined and produced and actually recording it <laughs> and actually <laughs> recording it and not not attempting to transcribe uh in in media res as things, I have so many things notes. going on <laughs> so many just written like approximations of <laughs> the campaign we did with mine and you're so brave for doing that Yes, yes. But we now we have technology. Now we have software and wonderful little Discord bots to, to help us make this podcast. Beautiful Craig's. Oh, uh, we love him. Love Craig. No. Uh, no, we don't. He can leave anytime. As well. Here, Craig. <laughs> he may turn at any moment. Oh. So, where do we go from here? We're playing with dice. We're playing D and D five E, but with a little homebrew spice. Homebrew <laughs> spice, meaning uh, I believe Kev is the one with the most practical D and D experience proper, which is not saying much. <laughs> <laughs> I I have dated someone who is avidly a D and D player. I myself am loosely familiar with the rules and have played some. A 5e games <laughs> as a player. We've all listened to, to D&D podcasts. We've all played very casual D&D games. This will be our first attempt at playing a game with some actual hard and fast rules. Uh, and I think it's going to be fun. I think it will be a, a fun learning experience for all of us. But one of the biggest, I suppose, focuses... Uh, of our play style is we're character and story first. So if we feel that it's just better writing to not fuss too much about certain rules and mechanics, then we're probably going to go with something like that. But everyone loves seeing someone just beef a roll. Everyone loves seeing like a, a nat 20 hit. So in the instances where it does seem cool and fun, yeah, we'll we'll follow 5e rules and mechanics. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think our podcast is great, so hopefully everyone else does. I think and, I think our rules yeah. are fun. Yeah. yeah. We follow the rules of fun. So exactly. For sure. The only rules we need. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So getting into the development of this specific world and campaign, uh, our campaign, the Evergreen Kingdom campaign, uh, takes place in a fantasy realm, partly inspired by ancient Greek myth and themes and aesthetics. It's a world where anyone can become a god if they accumulate enough magic. Uh, but to truly become a god and wield that power, uh, their mortal form must be given up for a divine one. So mortals have a transactional relationship with the gods. Gods depend on mortal prayers and offerings to convert into magical energy that sustains them. And in turn, gods manipulate the physical world to benefit their worshippers. So if a god performs badly, humans can choose to abandon them and the gods will fade into nothingness once they run out of their supply of magical energy. So it provides an incentive for gods to provide for humans rather than smite them. And it kind of puts humans on a little bit more of a a level playing field uh, when (laughs) dealing with gods in this world. So that's how the the magic system plays. It's something that I've been workshopping for a a couple of years now. Um, I'm super excited to get into it more, but we'll get into it more when we get into the campaign proper. Right now, though, uh, our story takes place in the small farming town of Hearth. It's a humble settlement in the heart of a vast mountain range. And within that town live three mysterious elders uh, dubbed by the townsfolk as the teachers, quote unquote. They've lived on the outskirts of this town for centuries uh, in their estate carved into the side of the mountain. Notoriously reclusive, uh, the three of them, Athatria the Librarian, Zephyrius the Forge Master, and Ithaca the Spell Spinner, have recently decided to take on apprentices in their respective disciplines. Uh, and it's those apprentices who our story will be following. So jumping into characters, uh, we want to do a couple of introductions. Yeah. Nice. Um, I'm Margaret, and I'm possessed by these little characters that fight their way out into illustrations, comics, animations, and d and um, I'm playing Matteo Morodi. Uh, I work at the library under Lady Athatria and spend much of my time there researching for my own purposes. Uh, you may refer to me as he or they or not at all. Uh, and he is a rogue. Woo! Nice to meet you, Mateo. Lord. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's great to meet you, too. <laughs> Hello, God. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid. Hi, I'm afraid. Shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So I'm supposed to be introducing myself now. But uh, I'm Maddie, and I'm a sometimes comic artist, and I play the character Mamori. So my character's pronouns and my pronouns are both she and her. Um, and my character is a fighter class, and she's studying under Zephyrius, the Forge Master. And um, so I'm Mamori, and I have all snacks. I work part time for the town baker in exchange for room and board, and I'm a generally chill person to have around, pretty quiet, um, unless you threaten someone I care about, and then I will destroy you. Very cool. Very nice to meet you, Mamori. Thanks, God. (laughs) (laughs) Kev, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Kevin. Um, I'm a creature that these kids found in the woods and then hid in their closet. Um, my character is a divine soul sorcerer uh, named Sildra with they them pronouns. Um, my name's Sildra. Uh, I guess I like fishing and beating old people at board games. Uh, Ithaca's like the least annoying person that I found around here. So I've been sort of her apprentice for a while. She's like the local hippie elder, I guess. You know any fishing spots? 
Oh, we'll find plenty of fishing spots for Sildra over the course of this campaign, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm Grace, the DM of this whole campaign and the man behind the curtain editing this podcast. I'm a designer, illustrator, and a big lover of stories, characters, and world building. I've been working on this specific campaign and its story and its world for a long time now. Uh, And I'm just so excited for us to jump in on this adventure with my friends and all of you listeners. Gwen, Squace? Yes, Gwen. (laughs) If you can imagine it, we we all like each other, right? That's why we're doing this. Yeah. Theoretically. Taking down I'm, notes from I'm in Amori. trouble. I'm <laughs> taking down notes from Maddie's character. <laughs> yes, you're alone. Amori deserves none of this. Uh, Debatable. Uh, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Save it for the game. That's also a spoiler. If we're cutting, if we're cutting, come on. Say that to uh, her face. I don't care if that's cut. I just want to say that to you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is so much fun. Absolute ah, da, da. Goonies. <laughs> Grace, you have to say, like, you have to tell us, like, well, that's us. Hope you like the game. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> well, well, like, that's the end of the campaign. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and- or- well that yeah. well that was a fun adventure, right? See you next time around. <laughs> <laughs>
you have no idea how great it is to have someone like you with an in with someone like him. I tell you, kid, you are indispensable to this place. I can't ever lose you. Uh, well, I'm glad to be of service, but, uh, how many more of these, these jumping jacks are we gonna do? Because, um, I, I do have to get to my part-time job eventually here. Yeah, 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 no, no, you're, you're totally good. Listen, uh, it's still a little bit early. I'm sure you don't have to be, you know, at, at the bakery just yet. Uh, do me a favor, though, bud. I need you to do just, like, a quick patrol around town. Check in with me. Make sure that everything's running smoothly. Nothing to, you know, keep an eye on. I've got the front gates over here. You just, you know, do a quick sweep through town center and, you know, report back to me of any any potential goings-on that needs, you know, she kind of beats her chest. She's like, that needs old Kalia to straighten out. It, it, should I take the the long route or like you know the shorter smaller route around town because i mean lately we've been kind of doing the short route so well listen i i don't mean to you know aggravate your you know kind of wheezy disposition you know i know those jumping jacks probably winded you more than you would like to admit take the short one you know, don't stress yourself too much. And then, how about this? You swing back here later this evening, we'll do the long wrap together. How about that? Get your exercise in for the day. All right. I'll see you later. Memori walks off, I guess. She gives you a big, cheery salute and goes back to sitting in this kind of ramshackle-looking guards post uh at the very entrance of town she sits very straight up and stares directly at the gates waiting for any potential new people to walk into town to politely welcome <laughs> the wonderful town of hearth okay yeah i think Mamori um kind of starts her walk but it's it's leisurely right like it's not she's not going super fast i think she's kind of like winded from all of the training they've been doing and um i'm just imagining that she's like pretty relaxed and because as far as we've established like nothing is really like this is a pretty quiet town so oh yeah see the the town guard started because colia did some research into the the history of this region and realized wars happen sometimes and that really freaked her out so she she had the sense to put together you know town guard with the only problem being that nothing happens around here it's a peaceful cheery little town you know the few you know rabble rousers that try and come in and start shit are very quickly you know addressed by you know various people in town dealt with you know in a a fair judicious way um but there's really not not a huge need for you know big old defenses you know you have the the big front gates at the the entrance of town that you know if anything tries to pop up they close the gates and hearth is naturally protected in you know the the depression in the the earth they're in you know very there's really only one way to get into town safely so there's been no no historic need for you know a great defense force so yeah your your quote-unquote patrol through town is relatively uneventful if there's anywhere in town that you would like to stop anyone you would like to see you're welcome to you know mosey Oh, 100% Mamori is going to check on Zaparius and just, like, see what he's up to. If he's at the forge, like, Mamori's going to stop by there first. Um, I mean, not first, but, like, definitely going to stop there on her round. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. We, we can follow Mamori up to the estates on the north side of town. You know, as you make your way through the... Slowly waking up, but soon to be bustling town center full of shops and residences and, you know, a trader's market with rotating merchants that come through. You pass through and, you know, directly on the outside of that that main hub of town, there is 
a very, very steep stone staircase that leads to a cliff that juts out from the side of the basin ridge. As you walk up these big stairs, you enter these sprawling properties of the estates, which is, you know, the the local name for this kind of private set of residencies that contain a sprawling library, the elegant greenhouses, and the object of your affections in, in a strictly fascinated sense, what is referred to as the shit shack, or Zephyrius's workshop. You know, Momori takes offense to that nickname. It's not something she would ever call it. It's the forge to her. And she keeps it clean, just to be clear. Oh, it's, it has improved so much during your time here, during your, your mentorship with Zephyrius. What, what used to be a nasty little stain on the, the side of the estates is now a slightly less nasty little, little working space. And as you see people milling about the estates, going to the library, you know, just enjoying the the walk of the grounds, you make your way to the forge. And inside you see the the rounded, hulking figure of Zephyrius the Forge Master. Your your mentor, your teacher, and the most curmudgeony, bulldoggy man this town has ever seen. And as he's hunched over working, he sees you stick your head in. He's like, oh, Mamori, <clears throat> there you are, kid, get over here. I need, I need your, your hands on this. He's kind of showing you the, the latest piece he's been working on. And it is, in fact, Kolya's spear. You're up early, Mamori says as she walks in. Well, uh... The ladies reminded me to look at the calendar, and I realized that this piece has been sitting uh, on this bench for about four weeks now, uh, and that this is in fact due to its owner in a matter of hours. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so good. Kalia was asking me about that. Yeah, I had a feeling. Oof. Yeah, not. She's she's great. Love you know. She's got a lot a lot of enthusiasm in that one. This is not. Not her first piece she's commissioned me for. So I really can't afford to lose her business. Um, However, I do have other, frankly, more interesting pieces I'd rather be working on. So, and he claps a hand on your shoulder, you're going to be taking care of this one, kid. Are you sure you don't want to finish it yourself? It is for Kalia. For our town guard very important yeah and and you're in that that guard club too or whatever you know listen you've been doing pretty good work these past couple of months i i want to see what you can do with this piece you know you just give it a crack it, it has the bones down there all you got to do is tighten it up give it a give it a whirl make sure you know the balance is right the, the finish looks good get this thing looking customer ready and then we can move on to something a little bit more interesting for you. All right. Uh, Mamori picks up a hammer and um, goes to the forge to finish off the piece. Hey, I want Mamori to make a dexterity check. Oh, that's, Lord. That's a mechanic. Okay, um, I've got We're my... We're going to do our first dice roll to see how well this... This sword comes out. All right, I've got my 20-sided die that I stole from my kid brother's uh, Yu-Gi-Oh card deck. Do not ask me why there's Dungeons and Dragons dice (laughs) set inside the Yu-Gi-Oh card deck box that I gave him, but here goes. That's a 14. That's a sweet, sweet little 14, Grace. And my dexterity modifier is plus two. Okay, so that is a a solid 16. I would say, okay, on a 16, it takes you the better half of the morning to to get through this piece, mm-hmm. but you are you are not an amateur smith. You know, you've been 
you've been at this for several years now, mm-hmm. honing these skills of yours and finishing up, you know, a spear that was two thirds of the way done anyways. This is nothing for you. This is easy. All right. And, you know, you wrap it up and, you know, Zafarius comes over from what whatever he was working on. He's tinkering at one of his several workbenches. He, you know, waddles on over. He's like, all right, let's see what you got. Mori kind of holds up the piece. Oh, okay. He, he examines it. He turns it this way. And he's like, all right, all right. Now you've got got a good weight to it. I like the taper here. Very hmm, some inspired hammering to to the hilt. And, all right, all right, kid. And he gives you another pat on the shoulder. He's like, all right, I'll finish you know up the the leather work and you know getting getting the final polish on this. But not bad, not bad at all. Uh, Mamori is like her her face is very stoic. But um, Zaparius can tell, like, because he's known her for a bit, like, she is very pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get a big head, kid. Your next project's gonna be a little bit bigger than this. All right, at that, Mamori definitely smiles. She grins at him. (laughs) (laughs) All right, listen. This this has to get back to, uh, to Kalia before the end of the day, so. Did some good work this morning. Go, go bring this back down to her and then uh, come, come back back up here, you know, later today, tomorrow, when I, whenever you can bring yourself back up here. And uh, we can get started on something uh, something I've been meaning to work on for a while now. And he kind of gestures towards, you know, his workspace that's just, it's a mess. It is a mess. You don't know how he manages to make such a an absolute trash pile wherever he's walking and working, but he seems to know what's going on. You have no clue what it could be, but he seems excited about it. All right, but please remember to eat lunch today and not just throw your trash on the floor afterwards. And try not to throw anything else on the floor. It's all these rules for me. Jeez Louise. Okay, okay, no trash. This is basic hygiene. It's not like it's unclean or, you know, contaminated. It's not germy. You're not gonna catch a disease from... Ramori points out a, you know, very suspiciously rotten carrot underneath one of the workshop benches and, um, raises her eyebrows at him. Ah, fine, fine. He grabs a broom and he starts cleaning up his mess. That was a bad carrot anyways. I bought that thing. It was half rancid. That was not my fault. Mamori uh, waves her hand and kind of exits the workshop with the, the spear, right? She's supposed to be taking that. So Mamori is making her way back down from the estates over towards the the front gates where Kalia is at. Let's move on now to Mateo. Mateo, you are starting your day already at the library. You're up bright and early, crack of dawn, as is Athatria's marching orders for all of her library aides. You know, as soon as she's up, everyone else had better be up as well. And, you know, you're going about your, your morning routine situating yourself at your your working desk and then going over your list of tasks for the day. Nothing too, you know, extraordinary. They're rotating amongst the various aids. So you see that you have to replace some texts that were put away in the wrong place. You see that you got to resort some artifacts and <laughs> you see at the bottom of the list that it is your turn to bring over the monthly offering to the Temple of Storm and Harvest. Why the fuck do we always get stuck doing this shit? Okay, uh, where the hell is this? Um, what season is it, by the way? Uh, it is late summer. It, it is, I would say, early August time of year. So the fields are lush with 
crops. It's a beautiful day, temperate weather, minimal clouds in the sky. It's just so, it's such a nice day today, Mateo. Such a nice day to walk down to the temple to deliver an offering. <laughs> uh, it's such a beautiful, probably hot day, and Mateo is wearing, um, like, basically a blanket um, that just, like, drapes over his arms. Uh, and he's got his, like, huge bushel of hair on his head that, like, is everywhere. Uh, he, he looks like he just rolled out of bed, um, but you can rest assured he did not sleep a wink last night. Uh, one of the, the other library aides, uh, whose name I have written down? I don't know their name anyways. Yeah, you don't know their name anyways, but, you know, an aide looks over at you, kind of, like, going over their own list for the day. And kind of sees, you know, the task that you got saddled with. And you're not very friendly with any with anyone. Um, but this one particular aid can't help but kind of like snark a laugh and be like, hmm. Well, we better better get on that one, huh, buddy? The poor lady she'd be awful heartbroken if uh, the monthly offering doesn't get there in time. Hey, if it was important, it would have been on the top of the list. We work we work at the number one and we go down, all right? Well, you know, you're so so full of such good ideas, you know, maybe maybe you should do that one first. Meanwhile, uh, me and the other aides will uh we'll be here, you know, stacking books and not having to go to the temple. And you know, this this asshole aide and like some of his other friends are just kinda like laughing at your expense. Because you're rude to them, and you're having a, a less than great experience. Uh, Mateo just glares at them, and uh, where is what is this offering that I have to get? So the offering is left outside of Ephatria's office. It is the personal offering of her and her fellow teachers. They bring to the temple every every month. Everyone has some sort of offering that they bring, and this is theirs. Uh, and outside of her office is. A bushel of freshly cut flowers, a very nicely carved letter opener, and it looks like it was maybe supposed to be a vase, but whoever was making it kind of gave up halfway through, slapped some paint on it, and it's a piece of abstract art. Let's let's call it. And that constitutes an offering. Something personal from the individuals offering it up, so to speak. Is it a nice letter opener? It is. It's fairly nicely crafted. There's some pretty little stylings on it. Okay, uh, Mateo picks it up. Um, how busy is this library? Uh, this time of day, not very. You know, it, it's early enough in the morning that, you know, you guys are kind of the ones to open up shops, so to speak. There are a few townsfolk milling about, but otherwise, really only a handful of people in right now. The chief librarian at Thatria is not not in, so far as you can tell. Or at the very least, she's not in the, the main section of the library. Um, is this like a package that is like enclosed? Or are these just like loose items that are on the ground in front of her office? They, they're they bound together. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um... Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no. What's going through Mateo's head right now? I think you I think you know what Mateo is thinking. He's outside his supervisor's office looking at their personal offerings to the town gods that he was tasked with bringing. I mean, I don't know what the hell a storm god or harvest god needs with these goddamn eclectic things, but okay. Um <laughs> I could use a letter opener. I mean, I already kind of have a dagger that's ornamental, but you know, you could always use a second one. Sure, sure. Um <laughs> but if it's bound I won't I won't fuck with it. Um okay, so I guess I'm going to bring these here before these uh jokers laugh at me anymore. <laughs> yeah, you 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 collect the the offering and you make your way out of the library and down the the big old staircase and make your way towards the temple. And as you approach, you see a young man and his older-looking father with him. This young man is well-built, dark hair. And he, he sees you, and his face lights up, and he, he gives a big wave. He's like, Mati! Mati! 
it's me. It, he's kind of like waving. He's like, Monty, it, it's Rami. How, how, how are you doing? Yeah, yes, Rami, I, I know it's you. Hello. Hi. Oh, uh, are, are you going into into the temple? He kind of like gestures over his shoulders like, oh, I, I never see you around here. Oh, my goodness. This is oh, what a what a pleasant surprise. Dad, dad, this is Mateo. We, we went to school together. Remember? His dad just kind of like nods his head, doesn't say anything. He's you know got a hat on. He's old, disinterested, you know, in stark contrast to his very excited well-spirited son and he says what have you been up to i i haven't seen you around in in a while are are you well what what's new uh mateo is a little overwhelmed by all this questioning uh R- rami i walk past here twice a day what do you mean you haven't seen me what do you think i've been doing uh avoiding you or something you should get your head out of the chicken coop and maybe you'd notice me well, well, you're always so busy, you know. You you really just go, you know, straight from from home to to the library and back. I, I'd hate to bother you, you know. You seem like you're doing some some important work up there. Uh, he he kind of gestures to the the parcel in your arms. He's like, oh oh man, are you are you delivering an offering? You, I I don't think I've ever seen you go go in the temple. You know, this is you know this is new for you. Uh, well. This isn't for me, it's for Lady Athatria and the others. Oh, that 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 makes more sense, yeah. I mean, oof. he, he kind of rubs the, the back of his neck. He's like, I know you're not the biggest fan of the temple, and, well, to be honest, there's there's a new acolyte in there, and I think you'd eh, kind, of, kind of freak him out. <laughs> so, uh, hey, well, I can bring these in there for you. How about that? He, he kind of, like, reaches out uh, a hand to, to take the, the offering from you. Um, Mateo, like, when he, like, kind of bristles like a cat <laughs> when uh, Rami holds his hand out for this thing. Um, he's like, oh, all right. Sure, yeah, take it. He takes it, and, you know, he's, he's now got a, a nice armful of the, the teacher's offerings and his own family offerings of some fresh harvest vegetables and, you know, a, a nice, you know, knitted hat from one of the livestock that his family owns. He's like, well, you know, we, we better get inside and get get these all situated. But um, it was it was really good seeing you again. Maybe I'll see you on on the way home. Maybe. Uh, don't wait up, I guess. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, <laughs> Mateo turns around. Uh, before, uh, he starts blushing, and he's like, what the f- what was that about? What was that? <laughs> uh, you head back to the library, task fulfilled, and, you know, the other library aides kind of see you come back empty-handed, and they're like, yeah, okay, did his job, I guess, and go back to giving you a, a pretty wide berth as you return to setting stacks back where they along their proper place and, you know, occasionally looking through some of these texts for, for your own interest. Is there anything in particular that Mateo has been looking to research as of late? I mean, we know uh, Mateo has a particular interest in the Storm God. I don't know if Mateo's uh, picked up any interesting tidbits lately on that. Yeah, you have that one ancient journal that you've parsed through fairly well at this point. Going through the back catalog of various texts and scrolls, you've certainly stumbled upon some new interesting texts regarding some of the gods beyond the, the Great Range region. Nothing, nothing that stands out too terribly much beyond, okay, these are some other deities that are worth keeping an eye on just based on their track record. The Storm God is not the only one noted to have outbursts and <laughs> temper tantrums. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, Mateo complains loudly about how drafty it is uh, to whoever is nearby. <laughs> Collective. Ugh. You're wearing a blanket. How are you feeling a draft? These windows are shit. I keep telling Lady Athatria that they need to be replaced. There's a draft here everywhere I go. I'll be sure to set Zephyrus right on that. Don't you worry. <laughs> As... Lady Athatria saunters right behind you with her own armful of books. 
She's like, yes, that, that window really, it really does leak, doesn't it? Bearing in mind, is not a very convenient window to be drafty, because you two are two stories up in, in the library, and it's not a very easy reach, but, you know, someone's got to fix it, and it's not going to be either of you. Absolutely not. It will get fixed, don't you worry, my student. Thank you, by the way, for running that errand for me. I usually try to be a little bit better about making sure that offering gets there before the end of the month, but, uh, uh things, things get missed, and if that offering isn't there, well, if the go gets less than pleased with me. I, I know it's, it's not your favorite place in the world to be, but hopefully it was, you know, as painless as it could be for one errand. You're putting a lot of stress on this, and it really wasn't that big of a deal, honestly. <laughs> do you want me to do your dry cleaning next? I can drop that off. <laughs> oh, not a big deal to you, but between the people down at the temple, the people waiting for me back at home, this is a bigger errand than I would like it to be. It was a walk down the street, Lady Atta. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> it was much appreciated, is all I'm saying. I've got quite a handful of things that need some reorganizing. And she kind of drops her stack into your arms. And she's like, this way, we've got quite the afternoon ahead of us. And brings you towards the restricted section of the library that holds only her most valued artifacts. And as you walk by, the rest of the aides look on jealously as you curry the favor of the chief librarian. <laughs> uh, I, I, Mateo looks back at them and raises a single eyebrow cheekily and then does not pay them any more mind. <laughs> Very nice. Alright. Uh, and from there we will bounce to Sildra. Sildra, you are spending this beautiful summer morning in the town center, set up with some chairs, playing some card games with the local old folks that like to hang around town center and play old folks games. You know, this is a crew that you're acquainted with through Lady Ithaca's lecture series, I should say, lecture slash body work slash meditation slash sermon slash slash slash. She covers a lot of bases. But they're a nice enough group, and they know how to play a good game. And as you're playing, you know, you're you're observing kind of the local people running about. You're very good at, you know, picking people out of a crowd. And you're particularly good at picking suckers out of the crowd. And right now, the sucker in front of you is a very round, very innocent-looking ten-year-old dressed like a clown. Because he's working at a merchant table. One of the rotating merchants that comes through town. And this merchant table happens to be run by a bunch of clowns. That's, that's their theme. They're selling some okay-looking wares. Nothing too exciting. And this ten-year-old who's hanging out with a couple of teenagers trying to make a, a decent buck sees you playing cards and stumbles over. And he's been, you know, hanging out with you for the past hour or so. He's kind of got his his head on on his hand he's like so so what kind of card tricks do you know i mean i don't know what kind of names are they have but i can do this and they kind of um hold up a handful of cards and flick one of them into the air and catch it and when they catch it it kind of flips back towards the kid so they can see what the card number is. Whoa! Wait, that's that's my card! Oh my gosh, I was just thinking the number two! Whoa! Oh, are you like are are, are you like magic? I mean, it's it's not really magic, it's just Yeah, sure, why not? I'm magic. Oh, that's so cool. And he's, you know, his big round face is all lit up. His little jingly cap is, you know, swaying back and forth as he's watching you play. He's like, so, so if you know magic, like, uh, does that make you like, uh, uh, like a spellcaster no. or something? Like, are, are you, are you like, 
Are you studying to be um um like a like a cool cool mage or they, or like a They kind of cut him off and the they had a slight playful smile on before it is gone now. They're just stone faced and just staring them right in the eyes. No, I am not uh I'm not a mage. He he stares back up and he's like Whoa. You're kind of freaky. I like that. And he, he calls over to the, the teens working at the booth uh, behind him. He's like, hey, hey, got Draxa, Draxa, this guy, this one's creepy. Can, can we bring him back? I think he would fit in. And, you know, Draxa, the teenage girl, also in clown garb, kind of like glances up and she's like, Albino, stop fraternizing. If they're not a customer, they're not worth your time. Who says I'm not a customer? I could be persuaded. She waves you over. She's like, all right, then stretch. Check out our wares. We've got, uh, let's see. And she's kind of rummaging through, you know, what's on display. She's like, here, beautiful pendant made of crystal glowing green. Why is it glowing green? I don't know, but it sure is. And it sure is for sale. You want it? You don't sound very enthused about all this. Well, I have a feeling that my audience is going to be less than receptive to what I'm selling. I'm sorry I'm not selling cool card games or, you know, whatever it is people like you like, you know, to gamble away. I've got pendants. I've got, let's see, uh, got a glass vial of something or other. Where did he even get this stuff? All I'm here to do is sell what I can. If you're not going to buy it, don't worry about it. But stop hogging. And she kind of like pulls pulls the little little kid back towards her. Stop hogging my staff. Your staff came to me. I didn't hog anything. But listen, if you want to sell some stuff, I've got a couple of tips for you. She kind of leans closer. She's like, oh, please blow me away. You guys are clowns, right? You're actors. You're performers. Am I wrong? Uh, Bobino gives a, a very jangly, jingly, enthusiastic nod. So, why not put on a show instead of just standing around and fraternizing? She goes to answer you, and across the town, you hear an explosion go off. Story Horde is produced by Grace, Maddie, Margaret, and Kev. Our theme song was written and composed by Vocal Outburst. Follow for updates and artwork on Twitter and Tumblr at Story Horde Pod, or visit our website at storyhorde.card.co. You can find all these links and more in the description of this episode.